Hi everybody. Um, I'm going to finish up my lecture on plastic surgery. I just wanted to go through a few things first. Uh, I'm making a lot of posts on Facebook. I, I realize that. Uh, just so you don't miss anything and that you're keeping up with everything, make sure you scroll through. I would do it every morning and every evening. Scroll through the whole page and make sure you didn't miss anything because that really is the best way for us to get out announcements to you guys instead of sending individual messages and emails. So please check the Facebook, make sure you're not missing anything. So I would scroll on that every morning and evening. Uh, other than that, uh, I asked you guys for questions and I got a whole lot of questions. Uh, so I get what I asked for, I guess. Thank you for the questions. I think I've responded to all of them so far. Um, if I ever don't respond, it's probably just the time I've been trying to cut myself off about 8.30 or 9 o'clock and get off of our Facebook page, but it's difficult because I know you, your questions are sitting there waiting. So I'll try to get those answered as quickly as possible. Um, as far as what I said yesterday, it definitely worked. I asked you guys to comment and question. I got lots of them. Um, as far as participation grade I just want any comment I just need to know that you're watching it so as much as hey I loved that YouTube video about this or as much as a mind tap question whatever you'd like to do just so I know that you watch the lecture and you are participating um, other than that I'm gonna post your slideshow on hands here in a little bit and we'll start there with the lecture so page 759 on hand surgery uh, a lot of people don't think of hand surgery as being plastic surgery, but a lot of plastic surgeons specialize in hands. Uh, it's because it's very different, you know, than other plastic surgeries. So uh, lots of different details with that. So we'll get into who's going to do orthopedic procedures, who's going to do plastic procedures, who's going to do neuro procedures, because we do have nerves deep in the hand, too, that just neurosurgeons are going to work on. So... Hopefully you got the page now, 759. Let's talk about just some basic anatomical terms. So volar surface is the palm of your hand, and the dorsal is, of course, the back. Um, when you're going through this anatomy, always think anatomical position. So if you remember, it's like your patient is laying in supine with their arms out. So your hand is up like this. And that brings me to the next page, 760. So radial refers to the thumb side of the hand and the ulnar side refers to the medial side of the hand. So this can confuse people if you're not laying in anatomical position because if you're like this, you're thinking my pinky, my ulna is not on the medial side. Well, you need to flip that around so you're in correct anatomical position. So again, radius on the thumb side, ulna on the pinky side. So whatever helps you remember that one. I do have some little um, mnemonics and things like that to help you remember things like these carpal bones, but anything to help you memorize these because it goes through it here for a reason. It's not going to go through this in orthopedics, even though this anatomy, of course, is in orthopedic surgery. So make sure you're learning it now because it will not be reviewed in orthopedic surgery. We'll be focusing on bigger bones in that chapter. Okay, so as you're going through, like I said, know your eight carpal bones. Uh, know what your metacarpals are in the palm of your hand. So all your bones right here. And of course, your carpals, your wrist bones. So all the way from the phalanges to your carpal bones, you need to know. Uh, know what those joints are called, your metacarpophalangeal joints, or MPJs, if you don't want to have to pronounce that word. Uh, you should also know the nerves on page 761, especially the median nerve. The book actually goes into very good detail about the different compartments of the arm and how that works. I want to break it down a little bit for you. So on page 761, second paragraph, top of the page, the anterior compartment of the arm, that tunnel, that compartment it's talking about is that carpal tunnel. That is the tunnel. So the median nerve is going to pass through that tunnel. Typically, that's the anatomy that you need to focus on, on the anterior portion, but you just need to be familiar with how many compartments are on the dorsal side. So on the dorsal side, there's six compartments. Um, anything in your arm, these tight compartments, they're lined with synovium. So this is going to lubricate the area by um, secreting that fluid so it can reduce friction and any issues that someone would have with that tight compartment. Um, okay, so know what your synovium is, your synovial membranes, and like I said, these nerves that are pictured on 761.
The median nerve is going to be usually worked on by neurosurgeons if you keep reading down. Most of the breaks are going to be treated by orthopedic surgeons. Plastic and reconstructive get a little bit of both, but it's really it's the reconstructive part. So they have very uh, specific requirements to allow them to do these surgeries. And as you read, you'll understand why some of these are done by plastic surgeries, whereas just a break would be orthopedic, just a carpal tunnel syndrome, working on that median nerve, that would be a neurosurgeon. So as you're reading, try to think who's going to do this surgery um, as you go through them. All right, so look at page 762. So this is really involved anatomy. I put this on the slideshow for a reason. I know I say I don't do an anatomy review, but we've got extra time, I'm at home. So there you go, you get a PowerPoint of anatomy review. Uh, but the pictures in your book are really fantastic. Uh, you don't have to know every single tendon, but you should be familiar with the muscles and the main tendons. Uh, the ones that are pictured in my slideshow, I would focus on those especially. So at this point, it basically skips from the anatomy a little bit and it starts talking about what to do with uh, severed limbs. So we're going to treat them all the same for the moment just for talking about it. So a severed hand or a severed finger is what we're talking about. So it starts on page 761 and it keeps going all the way through 64. So I want you to look at 762 at the bottom underneath those tendon and nerve pictures. So there's a lot of factors that affect the viability of being able to save a limb, basically. Save a finger, save a hand. So it talks about the type of injury, whether it's clean or dirty. Traumas, they can get so infected sometimes and it's so long before they can attempt to reattach it that it doesn't work. But they usually try. If they have any inkling that they could save a limb, a finger, then they absolutely will. So again, you know, clean versus dirty, uh, sometimes it could be a crush injury and it's crushed so much that they can't reattach it. But again, they're going to try. Um, the location of the amputation, uh, the extent of the damage, sometimes the blood vessels, nerves, and tendons just can't be reconnected and can't be repaired. Um, so they're going to, I've done many cases where you're sitting under that microscope for hours and hours helping them try to reattach these tendons and it doesn't work in the end. So at least we tried is what we can say at the end of the day. But unfortunately, some of these injuries are so bad, they just can't be repaired. Um, so extent of the damage, care of the severed item. So <laughs> item, the severed limb. So of course, I'm sure you know that if you cut off your finger, you need to put it on ice to take it to the hospital. Not everybody knows that. Some people don't do it in enough time. And so because of that, they can't reattach that limb. So because of that, in the operating room when you're scrubbed in, when we get that finger, first of all, it should already be on ice. It might be in a little Ziploc bag. They're going to give you that finger. Uh, usually you'll clean off the finger. It's not necessarily prepping it, but you're cleaning it off to make sure we're not you know, bringing anything dirty back onto that clean, prepped hand. Um, but you're going to get sterile ice to put that finger on to make sure that it stays viable as long as possible. Um... Okay, so let's talk some more about that. So go to page 764. So right underneath all the vascularity of your arm, it shows all your arteries and veins, which you do need to be familiar with too. Okay, so it's talking about reimplantation of the limb. So it goes through four bullet points on page 764. You need to know all of those. So tenorraphy, they're suturing the tendon. Neuroraphy, they're suturing the nerve. Restoration of vasculature. So we're doing an anastomosis. So we have to connect the artery and connect the vein so that blood is flowing properly to the finger or hand. And then bone approximation. So they put this in a funny order, of course, but those are all the things that have to be done when putting a finger or a hand back on. So typically they're gonna start with the bone first. So they say it's a finger, they're going to get a K wire and try to drill that wire through the finger into the hand. So if you look at page 765, equipment, instruments, and supplies. You do need to know all of these. This is an important procedure to pay attention to the supplies that are necessary because there's a lot of them. So see where it says Kirschwire wire tray. 
Those are called K-wires. We're gonna learn a lot about that in orthopedic surgery. But to start, it's going to line up the bones, basically. So we are gonna put that wire through the severed finger and then attach it and drill that wire through. So now the bone is back together where it is supposed to be. From there, you will see the next thing you need is your microvascular instrument tray. So they can do your vascular anastomosis. They can also try to repair, repair the nerve if they can, if it's viable. Um, and they're gonna do this all underneath the microscope. Uh, there are some surgeons who can do anastomosis under, with just loops, uh, not under the microscope. Very impressive. Uh, most people are gonna use that microscope. So you know you'll need a microscope drape and to have it ready and in the room before the surgeon's even in there. Uh, because of all these anastomoses of vessels, you're gonna need vessel loops. So don't forget your colors, make sure you study that and know that there's certain colors just for nerves. So be familiar with those. Uh, Preoperative preparation. So all these hand cases, you're gonna have that hand table. Hopefully you remember that from positioning and the OR as one of your first skill sets. So I'm sure you might have forgotten some of it. You might want to take a look at that, but you're gonna attach the hand table uh, to the OR bed or table. And then the first drape they usually use is a mayo cover. So it's about as wide as a mayo cover, so you can cover your hands nicely and drape that, and then add all of the extremity drapes or hand drapes on top of that. So again, orthopedics, we do lots of draping, um, even though it's not orthopedics, it's still a hand. So we're used to those multiple drapes for hand surgeries. So that's what you're gonna do. So know that you need that hand table attached to the OR table or bed and the different types of draping you'll need for that. So under practical considerations, you'll have to read through this surgery because I'm not gonna go through this one in particular because are we gonna do a whole lot of toe hand transfers? On page 765, not a lot. You will be doing a lot of reattachment of limbs. Uh, so that's really what I want to focus on. Now, if we are doing toe to hand or vice versa, hand to toe, something like that, you will need two surgical teams, so two surgical setups. So even though I've talked about doing free flaps by myself, I have never seen anybody do one of these by themselves because you truly do need two surgical teams. So you'll only be working on one or the other. As it goes through the procedure, I want you to pay attention more to the supplies. So like on page 766, it talks about what color the vessel loop is that they're gonna wrap around the nerve so they can gently retract it. Little things like that, the supplies is what I want you to pay attention to. Um, the anastomosis, <laughs> if you're anastomosing a vein in an artery, the suture is gonna be extremely small. Uh, when I did free flaps before the, the vein that we re most, we did it with a 90 nylon. And I remember that very well. I need another 90 nylon. And it's very thin, like a strand of hair, like I showed you in class. So definitely need to have the lights very bright in the room so you can see those very small sutures. And sometimes you can load them underneath the microscope if you really can't see the tips of those. But very small suture, lots of supplies to re most, so look for those when you're studying that procedure. On page 768, you'll see how they have the finger in ice, and again, that's going to be sterile ice, so we can open that to the surgical tech. Again, two workstations. Um, that means if one's using the microscope, the other one will be forced to use just their loops. So make sure you're going to have both of those inside the room. I think that's all I have for your amputations of hands and fingers. They can be really cool cases. They can also be extremely scary for the patients because they are coming in after a real trauma happened to them. So you need to have good patient care and calm these patients down as much as you can. Because as I've told you before, the way they go to sleep is usually the way they wake up. So if you go to sleep fighting with bad thoughts in your head, you're going to wake up with that in your head. We don't want that for our patients, so make sure you're making them feel comfortable and relaxed as you possibly can before that Versed kicks in and does its job. Okay, let's look at the next surgery. So, Duputrin's contracture. So, fun fact, I had to look this person up because I went down the rabbit hole and I was interested in it. So, <laughs> this is a French sur a surgeon. Well, he eventually became a surgeon at the time he was a doctor. So. Uh, Duputrins was a French doctor, and of course he named this, and it was because most of the families that presented with this had Viking heritage, so 
pretty much in northern European countries is where you're going to see more of these contractures. So it does run in families, but that's typically just where they've seen it so far. So not something for your test, just a fun fact. Um, so on your Dupuytren's contracture, when it says it can present itself in one of three ways, make sure you know all those three ways. So it can start as gentle as some little nodules, and then it can extend and become much more involved to where your whole hand is contractured down. Basically means you can't move your hand, it's forced down. So, of course, we're going to go in and fix this so the person can live their life normally and undo their hand. So because of this, the hand is contractured up, even if it's part of it, your hand's contractured up, so they need it to be laid out. So for this, they're going to have a lead hand. So the lead hand retractor, again, it's malleable. So you're gonna set the hand on top of it, pull that contracture back, and then grab that malleable piece of lead, put it on the edge of that finger, so it holds every finger down, so you can have nice retraction for your hand surgery. Um, as you're studying this, Again, think about supplies that you need in the room instead of maybe the step-by-step -step of the surgery. So for example, I said lead hand, you also might have to have your dermatome available because as they make these cuts, they might have to lose some skin and then they'll do some skin grafts to cover that up. But thankfully, we got plastic surgeons in the room and they're very good at that. If you look at page 770, it's going to go over the anesthesia for these cases. So hand cases, if they can, we're going to do a beer block. If you don't remember what a beer block is, you need to go check out your surgical pharmacology and review that. But I will remind you that you use an S-mark bandage. So um, hopefully you remember me wrapping up Brittany's arm. Poor Brittany in the front row gets the worst of it. Uh, so I wrapped up her arm with that blue S-mark bandage, and we held her arm up in the air so that arm would exsanguinate. If you don't remember that word, same thing. You need to look that up and study this because we need to exsanguinate the arm before we start the case so we have a bloodless field. So we need a bloodless field because of the exsanguination, but on most of these, on most of these cases, we're going to have a tourniquet. So that's how we're going to keep that bloodless field, and if we can... Avoid general anesthesia, we're going to do a beer block, but general anesthesia is an option also. Okay, page 771. So centralization of radial dysplasia. So this one's just known as club hand. Um, I did post a video on the YouTube channel. It's very short. It's just a surgeon manipulating that hand so you could see that it actually looks like a clubbed foot, even though it's a hand. So um, it's a it's a wide ranging deformity, so it could be smaller and it could be very, um, very involved. Sometimes it can be so involved that the radius isn't even there. So this is a, uh, it's considered hypoplasia, but it's radial dysplasia. So know both terms for that and know what it looks like. So it's a club hand and I put a video on the YouTube channel for you. If you look at page 772, it's got lots of pictures for you so that you can see all the different types and the severity of this defect. I do not want you to spend your time memorizing the different types. I just want you to see the big differences. So like between type 1 and type 5. Like type 5 has the complete absence of the radius. And that's actually the most common type. So things like that are what you need to pay attention to when studying these. If you look at page 7 to 73, the practical considerations. Note that this procedure is usually performed on really young children, so usually about a year old, 12 months old. We want to get these defects fixed when they're young so that they can learn and develop normally. Because if they have to learn and develop with these defects, it's going to be harder for them after the surgery to make that change. So the younger we can get this done, the better for the patient um, when it comes when it comes to, you know, getting back to normal life. So look at page 775, release of syndactyly. So I have seen this before. So syndactyly is where you have web digits. Um, it can occur in the feet too, but we're talking about the hands right here. So it's where the hands and feet fail to separate. So just like when I talked about cleft lip and cleft palate repair, remember how that is congenital, uh, happens in that first trimester. This is very similar. So basically you have little buds as your fetus and they're supposed to separate, but there was 
something that was supposed to happen that did not happen. So they did not separate, they stayed together. So now we have a surgery to go in and separate those fingers so they can live a normal life. So I posted a good video of this one too, so you can see how they do it. They don't really cut a straight line through those fingers that are stuck together. They typically do it in a Z, so it's just like your Z plasty. So a lot of things with plastics bleed into the other surgeries, which is one thing that I really like about it because they're all very similar. So know what syndactyl is, and then on page 777, know what polydactyly is. So this could be partial or complete, but it's duplication of your digits. So it may not be a whole extra finger sticking out. It might be on the edge of your finger, a little nubbin sticking out that was going to be another finger. So there's different severities of this one too, but they still want to go in and correct it. So on page 778, you'll see the different um, severities of polydactyly and all the different phalanx that it can happen on too. Um, you really don't need to go into all the details with this one, so pay attention to the same things I told you to, like equipment and like the age of the patient, still done very young, one and a half to age five. So pay attention to those things and you should know what you need to know for your exam. <clears throat> okay, let's talk about breast surgery. It's on page 781, breast surgery. Okay, so augmentation mammoplasty. So I really like these cases. I'm going to tell you some things that are not necessarily in your book about them. Um, for one, find where it says equipment, instruments, and supplies used. See where it says fiber optic retractor set. So you always need these lighted retractors for these uh, plastic surgeries, especially for breast cases. You'll also use that lighted retractor on an abdominoplasty and what's not in your book, a paniculectomy. So that's removing the panis. So very similar to an abdominoplasty, but because we're so deep in the body, they can't see very well. Plastic surgeons already have headlights on their head, but that's how deep we are, they can't see. So we need a fiber optic retractor for those so they can see what they're doing. Uh, plastic set for sure. Temporary implant sizer. So basically, what they do is they go in and put in uh, saline filled sizers. So this way they can basically go in and just inject saline into these expanders and it will expand slowly but surely. So if they don't want to jump sizes, they can slowly inflate that so that the skin can stretch and adjust. So we're not switching from say somebody who just had a radical double mastectomy so they have no tissue there, that skin has started to come back and it's not gonna stretch as easily when you put a giant implant in there. So they may wanna start with tissue expanders, fill them with saline. They can come into office visits and have it filled with more saline. So that skin is slowly and slowly stretching. So we're not tearing or damaging anything or ripping it. Um, look down at practical considerations. So. For this one, know the different types of implants. We still have silicone. We still have saline filled implants. I'll let you guys go down the rabbit hole and read about which one is better, uh, which one has better side effects and things like that. But as you know, with any type of medical implants, there are some that are recalled, um, some that people have had bad results with and you know others that it turns out just fine for them. So you'll get varying different stories depending on what kind of implants you look up. but come in all different types of shapes. Also, you'll read about the teardrop shape one in your book. So they're not all just round um, silicone implants. You have a variety. Looking at page 782, pay attention to the incisions they're gonna use for this case. So you can see them on page 783, but I want you to be familiar with the name. So periareolar line, so around the areola, and from mammary fold, axillary crease, so by the armpit, or even the umbilicus, so they can go on the belly button and work their way up. They can also do these endoscopically. Um, I haven't seen that before, I've only seen them um, open. As far as the implant goes, so it talks about sizing it and all that stuff, and we'll get to that. But as far as the actual implant goes, this part is important. You're touching an implant that's gonna go in the body, so they're gonna treat it just like a hip plant implant in orthopedics. They're not gonna let you touch it. So typically, even though it's sterile on your field, it's inside another package. 
and the other sterile package. So that package, you're going to peel back and set it on your mayo and present it to the surgeon so they can reach in and grab that implant. A lot of surgeons change gloves before using that implant. I worked with one surgeon who poured that holy water, so hopefully you remember what that is, bacitracin, gentamicin, and polymyxin B. We would pour that into the container that held the implant. So that way it was covered in antibiotic solution and we changed our gloves before we put that implant in and I was never allowed to touch the breast implants. So every surgeon is different. Make sure you're communicating with them, asking them what they want, but typically you're not going to touch those implants. Um, and that's just their paranoia or life experience <laughs> and their risk of infection. So anybody who doesn't need to touch it, don't touch it pretty much. So uh, make sure you're reading the preference card on this one and seeing exactly what the surgeon wants for these cases. Okay, now I can talk about the procedure now that I've talked about the implants. So... I talked about the different incisions that they're going to make. Typically going to use a 15 blade. A lot of plastic surgeons like what's called a 15C. So if you look at a picture of that, it's very similar to a 15 blade, but the edge of it is just slightly different and it gets them a little different curve when they make their incisions. So some plastic surgeons like that 15C, but it talks about a 15 blade in your book for right now. Then it talks about the pocket that they're going to make. So I want you to know the muscle that they can put this behind. I put a picture in your slideshow because it's hard to explain the difference so you can see when, when they put the implant over the muscle and behind the muscle. So they have two options of where to put that implant. But typically they're going to do what it says in your book and that is on number five on page 782. So they're gonna create that pocket for the implant and they're gonna um, put it beneath that pectoralis muscle. So it just says pectoralis muscle Remember, you have a pec minor and a pec major. So that's under that pectoralis major muscle. So make sure you add that in. Um, number six, this is where I was talking about the different sizers. Um, that could also be tissue expanders. So that's sometimes how they size it out. Every hospital is a little bit different on that. But implant sizers are used in the pockets and then inflated with saline. Um, the circulator at that point, it says the circulator, it's typically anesthesia because they're at the head of the bed. So somebody is going to raise the bed up as soon as you get the implants in. So the patient is sitting up properly so you can see the symmetry of these implants and see if the surgeon needs to make any adjustments. They usually do ask everybody in the room to take a look so that we can all basically to ease their peace of mind. So look good guys? Yeah, it looks great, surgeon. <laughs> so just make sure to... Uh, let them know what you think and let them know that they're doing a great job if it's nice and symmetrical. Uh, if you look at your picture on page 783, you'll see exactly where that muscle is and where that periareolar incision is. So there's lots of good pictures in your book. So I put uh, pictures that are not in your book basically on your slideshow. The rest of it is in your book for you. I gave you the extras on there. Okay, let's keep going, page 784. So this is about a tram flap. You guys know I like flaps. This is not a free flap necessarily. It is a rotational flap. So in your book, it's gonna say pedicle flap. That is accurate too. Pedicle, rotation flap, same thing. The idea is you still have the blood flow. It is still attached to the pedicle. So that means it's just gonna rotate up. So you can see in your book on page 785, they have that rectus abdominis muscle, and they're gonna look at any of those abdominal muscles and they can make sure to find the pedicle so they know they can keep that blood supply and then rotate it up to where that breast tissue was so they can cover up that hole basically. So they're gonna make, they're gonna fill that hole with this muscle um, instead of putting an implant in there. So because of this, it's still a vascular procedure. So we still need a Doppler in the room. That's at the bottom of page 785 to make sure um, that the flap has blood flow. But it is a rotational or pedicle flap. So it's not, it shouldn't be a free flap um, unless they specify that. So it kinda, it talks about both in your book and I wanted to separate the two for you. So if you look at number one, it talks about free flap reconstruction. So that would mean that the, they cut the pedicle so they can clamp that vessel and move it over and then do the anastomosis. So this one again is going to talk about pedicle flaps more, that rotational flap. So be familiar with 
number one and number two and the differences. So that's on page 784. So number two is what I just talked about, pedicle flap, you keep that blood supply. Because you kept that blood supply, you should keep some nerve supply, which means the skin will feel sensation. So that's all you need to add on to number two. On number one, the free flap, it says the patient's not gonna experience any sensation to that grafted area. But it doesn't really say it word for word for you on number two. So the pedicle flap, they will feel sensation on that area. Especially with free flaps, these can be kind of funny because depending on where you take the free flap from, you're going to have your patient's gonna have a very hairy chest. <laughs> so if they took it from your anterior thigh or your butt cheek and you're uh, flapping that up, it will still grow hair on it. So even though we're filling in that hole, uh, sometimes later on they have to do something about the hair that's growing on that. We have the same problem with ENT surgeries when we flap up a thigh graft to fill in the hole in the face uh, from mandible cancer, then they have, especially if it's a female, then they have a big patch of hair growing on their face. But at least we filled in that hole. Uh, after number one and two, I want you to look down where it talks about the reconstruction. So very bottom of the same page. So the reconstruction can be performed at the same time as the mastectomy. So if they do this, then you need to have two setups, a dirty and a clean setup. Um, and one of the mind tap questions, it asks the instrumentation differences between a radical mastectomy and a repair, basically. Totally different instrumentations, but if you do it at the same time, what they're going to be asking for is that they want two sterile setups. So make sure you're not cross-contaminating, and this is for cancer. So it's not, you know, the mouth or anything dirty clean, it's cancer, non-cancer. They're still going to use that term dirty and clean setup, because that cancer is considered a dirty setup. So that's your tram flap. You can see it on page 785, a good picture of it. Um, and all of your equipment and instrument supplies, that's what you need to focus on for that case. Okay, go to page 789 for nipple reconstruction. I really like these cases too. I had to draw out a little picture for you. So I put lots of pictures on your slideshow to, so you can see the different designs that they can make to fold it up into a nipple. But the plastic surgeon that I worked with, he just made a little cross basically. So the skin that was left over, he would map it out like a little cross, and then he would fold all the edges in. So he'd fold in these edges, and then he'd fold in these edges, and it would stack up, and he, by the time he was done sewing with that chromic suture, it looked exactly like a nipple, and we were ready for the tattooing. So all we had to do was pick out the right color. Very important job. You can work with your surgeon and try to match the skin tone as best as possible. But just think that your patient is asleep and you're making a decision for them. So it's very important to pick the right color for these. Um, as far as the tattoo machine, if it's not sterile, which I have not seen one that's sterile, they're gonna give you a probe cover, so it's a clear drape that you're gonna drape over the handle. Um, but they're gonna dip that needle into the color that you've picked out to properly color in the nipple for these procedures. So, very cool procedure. Um, if you look at page seven,